Amen. Amen. All right, here in 2 Peter chapter number 3, I want to begin reading in verse number 3. We're going to read verses 3 to 5. Verse number 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Look at verse number 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So here we have a prophecy that there's going to come a time, it says, in the last days where there will be people that are scoffers. And what does it mean to be a scoffer? It means to be a mocker, someone that's mocking or making fun of something. Now, if you look particularly, it says that these people are going to be mocking that there is the promise of his coming. And they're saying all things have continued as they were from the beginning of the creation. I think that it is abundantly clear when you read that this is that this is geared at a person that does not believe in God. And not only do they not believe in God, they're mocking the idea that Christians are waiting for and yearning for the return of Jesus Christ. They think that that is a ridiculous concept. And they say all things have continued as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now this is also found in Jude, a parallel passage almost verbatim. You don't need to turn there, but it's Jude verses 17 through 18. It says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> and I believe that that's referring to Peter and Jude right after the book of Peter. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. Notice mockers and scoffers were actually used interchangeably there. And also it says, in the last time. Afterwards it says this, who shall walk after their own ungodly lust. So these are predictions or prophecies that there will come a time when people will mock the Bible. They will mock Jesus Christ. They will mock and scoff at the concept of God. Notice the reason why, too, just a side note. It's not that, oh, hey, I've looked at the evidence and I've concluded that God's not real. Listen to this one more time. Who should walk after their own ungodly lust? So that's from the book of Jude, 2 Peter chapter number 3. Knowing this first, there's, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. These are people that, that sat down, they have no, they're not biased about anything, they looked at the evidence, and I've concluded that there is no God. No, it's people that are pleased with there being no God, because then they can just go after their own lust without their conscience bothering them, thinking, they don't want to, people don't want to go through life continually worrying that they have a, a higher power or a creator that's about to come down on them hard. People don't want to live their life that way. So you know what's better is just to just put God out of your mind. Just to re reject the concept that God even exists. Then you get, you know what you get to do? Walk after your own ungodly lust. You get to live your life in whatever way that you want, and you don't feel any sort of guilt. You don't, you know, your conscience isn't bothering you anymore. That's why, you know, people that reject the idea of God, that's the, the, the root of the reason why. It's abundantly clear that God is real. That's a ridiculous argument. The Bible says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When you look around this world, if you look around this world and think that there is no God, you are a fool. You are stupid. You really are. If you, if you really look around the world, you're like, no, God does not exist. You really have two options. Number Option number one is that you have to at least admit that a creator created everything. Something or someone created everything. Do you know what your only other option is? Nothing created everything. Do you know what evolution attempts to teach? Nothing created everything. Nothing created everything. Try to wrap your mind around that for a few minutes. Nothing created. There's nothing, no time, no space, no matter. There's nothing. Just nothing. And then all of a sudden there's something. From what? It's ridiculous. It, right. it defies science, and then they try to use science to teach this. Right. Right. It's foolishness. There is no such thing as science if nothing exists. Science is the study of things around you. Right. That's what it is. The study, gaining knowledge through testing, observing things around you. But guess what? None of this existed, buddy, Mr. Professor. So how are you going to test that and figure out that that's where it came from? 
No, it's a ridiculous concept. Just looking around at the world and seeing, not only just understanding the concept that, that you know, we live in time, and there was a time in which our universe began, therefore there had to have been something outside of time that created it. I mean, that's basic logic. There's no way around that. Just, just very elementary argument. But on top of that, just looking at the intricacies of the, of the Earth, just looking at the complexity of the DNA and everything, there's no way that you can reject the concept of a creator. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. If you, if you sincerely believe that there's no God, the Bible, I'm not calling you a fool. God says you're a fool. The Bible's calling you a fool. It's foolishness. It's stupid. That's just the facts. Now, here's the thing. <coughs> there's an increasing number of people in the United States today that are rejecting God. Just in general, the concept of God. They're rejecting Christianity, of course, because our nation you know, has been a Christian nation throughout its you know, uh, history, right? They're rejecting Christianity, and they're rejecting totally even the concept of God. There's an increasing number of atheists, of people that reject God. And like I said, an atheist, they're not rejecting God because they've looked at the evidence. They're rejecting God because of their own ungodly lust, because they want to live a sinful life, and God, you know, is cramping their style when it comes to that, right? So, these people, if you were to go to, and it's sad, but it's, unfortunately, if you were to go to a college today, a university, JU, Jacksonville University, if you were to go on that campus, it's to the point pretty much now where the majority, almost, maybe even the majority of people, would you would go around and ask the young people, they would say that they subscribe to some a sort of atheism. That they would say that they subscribe to some you know, sort of agnosticism. Like, I'm not really sure whether there's a God or there is a God or, you know, or, or there, there, I'm not sure if there's a God or there isn't a God or I just don't believe in a God. But there's an inclining number of people that just reject the Bible. Now, of those people, it's very rare that you walk in, that you, that you meet someone that's reasonable. We go out and we're knocking here, right? I've knocked on thousands of doors in my life. Many other people probably have it here too. How often do you meet someone that says, I don't believe in God, and then they're not with a sarcastic, mocking, scoffing attitude? It's extremely rare. I mean, I could maybe tell you, I, re I can tell you this, I remember one of them that just popped into my mind. That explains to you, you know, it, just a couple of years ago. It just it, That kind of gives you the idea of how rare that it is. It's, it's almost non-existent. All of them, they just mock and they scoff at the Bible. They mock and they scoff at God. Now, this morning, the, the title of the sermon is Answering the Atheist. Answering the Atheist. And there are certain things in the Bible that they'll point to all the time and mock and scoff and make fun at. And we're going to look at a couple of those passages this morning. We're actually, I'm actually going to show to you that they know nothing about the Bible. And that most of these passages, they're actually just entirely understand, misunderstanding. That they don't even understand what it's being, what's being taught. And it really comes from, and, and, and it's funny because they're the ones that try to puff themselves up and look like I'm so smart and so educated. But it really comes from an uneducated, uh, being uneducated, an uneducated perspective. It comes from being ignorant about what the Bible teaches. Now, they'll look at the Bible and they'll say, oh, the Bible's filled with contradictions and it's just a story of fables and it's a story of fairy tales and it was, you know, it was written by a bunch of uh, ignorant sheep herders. I've heard that before, right? Just a bunch of you know, sheepmen that are walking around and they're just herding their sheep and they're just as dumb as a box of rocks. Well, to start off with, I want to lay this foundation. The Bible was not just written by man. Man wrote the words down, but God is the author of the Bible. That's why the Bible is an amazing book. God is the one that spoke, spoke the words, and man wrote the words down. So let's begin here. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. <coughs> I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 21. So listen to this. 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 21 says this. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So notice that. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So it didn't come out of man's heart, right? It wasn't man's will just to write down all these words, right? But it says that holy men of God, <coughs> excuse me, spake as they were moved 
by the Holy Ghost. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. The Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration. Now, inspiration there means breathe or breath, saying that God spoke these words. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The argument that because man pinned the words down, excuse me, therefore man, man is the author of the words is a very poor, you know, uh, uh, ignorant argument in the first place. And the reason being this, you know who actually wrote down the words of Romans, the book of Romans? Does anybody remember his name? Tertius or Tertius, what he's referred to as well. Tertius is really the correct way to, to refer to him as his Greek name. Tertius is actually who penned the words down. But do you know who it, it says in your Bible when you read? When it, when it tells you right at the very beginning who wrote it? Romans is written by who? Paul. Or authored by who? They'll say authored in that sense by who? Paul. Because even in that sense, the one who was actually writing the words down, he was the manuensis is what that's called, wasn't the one that was speaking them. Do you notice what I'm saying? So that argument right there from the Bible's perspective fails. Because Tertius actually wrote the words while Paul spoke the word, words. But guess what? They weren't coming from Paul's heart. They were coming from God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Just like when God told Isaiah, My words which I have put in thy mouth. They might have been in Isaiah's mouth, but they weren't Isaiah's words. He said, My words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed from henceforth, saith the Lord, and forever. So that's a verse on the preservation of God's word, knowing that we have all of God's word in the King James Bible today. The same words that Isaiah spoke is what I have in my Bible today. Now, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Michaela, can you give me a, a water running? This is Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. And we're going to look at <coughs> a very common uh, 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 you know, a word in the Bible, and, uh, or animal to be specific, that the mockers will scoff at, the atheists will mock and scoff at and make fun of. And I'm going to show you that they actually have no idea what this word means. That they actually have no clue what this particular animal actually is. And there's actually a vast misunderstanding, even amongst Christians today, of what this word means. But I'm going to prove to you and show you that a shadow of a doubt, who this is speaking of. Or what this is speaking of. So... We're going to look at Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. Let me get there myself. Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. Right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. Now this animal, if you, if you look down there, you probably saw who it was. But it's the unicorn, right? It's the unicorn. And, and, and I personally had atheists bring this, up my, uh, hurt, bring this up to myself before. I've heard in debates between like uh, Christians and atheists, they'll, the atheist will just like, he starts to maybe lose or something, he'll just like kind of throw that out there. Yeah, but what about the unicorn, buddy? Or something. He'll start mocking how the Bible mentions unicorns, right? Well, the modern definition, let me read, let's start this way. <coughs> the, if you look up in a dictionary, the modern definition, and just a, this is a Webster's Dictionary, this is the definition of a unicorn. This is what it says. A mythical animal typically represented as a horse. So it will look like, a, it'll be a horse-like creature. Represented as a horse, and then it says, with a single straight horn projecting from its forehead, right? So it'll be coming out of its forehead. And when I said unicorn, that's probably what you thought of, wasn't it? Everybody just popped in their mind just a picture of a rainbow with a unicorn running or something, right? And had a, 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 made a big horn out of it, like a horse-like creature with a horn coming out. And this type of creature actually has been mentioned in like Greek mythology. It goes back to like Roman mythology. It's been mentioned in, in, uh, in like the Greek culture, if you will. So a lot of people will wonder, even Christians will wonder, why is the word unicorn actually mentioned in my Bible? Well, I'm going to explain to you and show to you what a unicorn actually is. So let's start by the Bible, right? Let's look at the Bible. Let's get the Bible's definition of what it is, not man's definition. So let's look at Job chapter number 39, verse number 9 here. It says this, Job chapter number 39, verse number 9. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? 
or abide by thy crib. Verse 10. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Now, one of, one of the things that I want to look at real quickly is, <coughs> I'm going to read you three other references. You stay here. I'm going to read you the three other references. I want to look at all of them of unicorn of the Bible. Here's Numbers chapter number 23, verse number 22. God brought them out of Egypt, and then it says this, He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. So notice what's being emphasized. We're going to identify this preacher in a moment, but it says the strength of a unicorn, right? So it's a strong animal. Numbers 24, verse 8. God brought him forth out, out of Egypt, talking about Israel. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. So it's a strong animal. Now listen to what it says. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrow. So notice, in tandem with the, with the uh, unicorn, it's talking about him being a fierce animal that fights. He's talking about God fighting in another aspect, but he's comparing the two things. He has great strength, and then he's going to destroy them. Right? Look at, uh, now I'm going to read you, don't turn there, Psalm chapter number 92, verse number 10. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. Right? So he says, my horn you'll exalt like the horn of a unicorn, saying it of, with great strength. Then he says this, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. One thing, of course, that we see being emphasized is the strength. You know what else you see being emphasized is specifically is the strength of the horn that he has. One horn. The strength of his horn and just his strength in general. Now, when we read in, in chapter number 39, verse number 9 and 10, was there anything that just screamed, just horse with a horn? Anything at all? Anything that we've read at all, period. Nothing at all, right? Actually... It implies to me something very different. I'll point that out to you in just one other moment. But you know what's very interesting? When you read in Job chapter number 39, God actually goes through and mentions a bunch of creatures, a bunch of animals, right? None of them are mythical creatures. I want you to look here in verse number 1. Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Is that a mythical creature? No, a goat is just a normal animal that we look around and see every day, right? Look at verse number 5. Who hath sent out the wild ass free? You know what a wild ass is? A donkey, a wild donkey. <clears throat> Look at verse number 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Are those, are those mythical creatures? Are those from Greek mythology? Are they just normal animals? You can go to a zoo and see all these animals today, can't you? A lot of people have farms and they'll possess a lot of these animals today. Look at, uh, I think I have one more here. Look at verse, verse number... 19. Now we're going to bounce off of this. I'm going to prove to you right now that actually what was mentioned in verse number 9 and 10 is not a horse. Because look at what's mentioned in verse number 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? So notice what was actually mentioned in verse number 19. What was mentioned? A horse. So what it makes sense, notice he's not repeating animals either. Would it make sense that he would previously have mentioned a horse and then now we're just going to mention a horse again? Further, let's prove that it's not because notice that different characteristics are, 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 are given to the horse right now than were given to what we read just a moment ago. Look at verse 19. Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. Now look at verse 21. He paused in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. So how is he going on to, eat, to meet the armed men? This is very important. Because he is being ridden by a man. And what's happening? He's taking him forth into battle. You understand? So he's going forth to meet the armed men in the battle. Now look at verse 22. <coughs> He mocketh that fear and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and shield. Now, so notice that this is referring to war. He's being ridden forth into war. Has that animal been domesticated? Yes. It has. It's being used, isn't it, in some way? The man is using it, isn't he? Go back to verse number 9 now. Let's look at the unicorn. Let's see what it's actually explaining. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? or abide by thy crib. Now, can you say that about a horse? Yeah. You can say that about a horse, can't you? Now, I want you to think about this. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you look up, what is the most common agricultural engine? It's a horse. And the engine doesn't have to be mechanical. It just any sort of animal that's being used, like even on donkeys and everything. The most common animal that is even still used today to, to furrow and harrow land is 
a horse. Notice what it's saying about, about this particular animal. It says in verse 9, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? Saying, will he listen to you? Does the horse listen? Was he listening to the rider? Was he going where he wanted him to go? He was, wasn't he? Notice the major difference between the two animals. Look at the end part portion of this, verse 10. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Now, is it, is it, is it, I don't know if everyone's familiar with what a furrow is. It can be, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a noun as in something that you can do, but it's also you know, like an instrument. It's like a haro. People know what haros are, because that's what's mentioned next. It's with the wheels, the big thing that you'll see animals dragging behind them, and it's plowing the ground. It's connected to the back of the animal, and it's this big instrument, and it's just, it's just basically plowing up the ground. It's tearing up the dirt. That's a haro, or a furrow is very similar. But a furrow actually digs like a, a small pit, just one individual pit, because you go through and plant seeds, and then you cover it up. Everyone understand what I'm saying? That's what a furrow is. So that's the difference. The haro is a longer instrument with like wheels, and it'll dig into the ground. And then the furrow is, is just one single individual like line or straight, you know, line of, of, of an instrument or different type of, of uh, mechanical, you know, uh, uh, tools, and it just digs just a pit. And then you can plant something in, like I said, and then you just fill it back in. Now, horses are used for that constantly. That, they're the most common agricultural engine, if you look it up. The most common, you know, resource that people will go to is not even, even still today, it's not even a mechanic, not even a John Deere or whatever. It's a, even a, it's a horse today. How much more so in the past? And what does he say about this animal? Yeah. Verse ten, one more time. Canst thou buy the unicorn with his band? That's obviously the band or the strap that would go around the animal that connects to the furrow. Do you do that to horses? Yes, you do. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? This is what horses are used for constantly. It's the most common animal that's used for this. So is it possible that we're talking about a horse? No. no. These are rhetorical questions. Saying, I can get him to do these things. I'm the creator is what God is saying. But can you get him to do this? Can you get him to? Can you get the, will the unicorn you know, abide in your crib? Saying, like, in your, if you were to go to your barn, you have a little area for the animals, right? Can, will the unicorn do that for you? No, he won't, will he? That's the answer. Will he serve you? No, he won't. Saying he would serve me, that's what God is saying. It's a rhetorical question to show God is, God is interrogating Job here, and he's, he's expressing his greatness unto Job, saying, I can get the animals to do all these things. I created all these animals, right? So notice, it's, we can prove by this one mention of the unicorn, that it is not a horse. It's not possible for it to be a horse. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what the unicorn is. And then I'm going to show you and prove to you what the unicorn is. And I want you to keep this in mind of what we just read. Number one, notice this. It is an animal that cannot be domesticated. And it is an animal that has one horn and it has great strength. When we look around at the world today, there's only one animal that this could apply to. You know what animal it is? A rhinoceros. It's the only animal when you look around at the world today that has not been domesticated. That it has great strength and that possesses one horn. Now, some people may say, <coughs> well, I thought, you know, rhinos had two horns. Well, there are different species of rhinos, of course. Like the most common, the reason why people think that is because the most common rhinoceroses have two horns, like the Sumatran rhino. That's the one you see at the zoo almost all the time. Then there's the white rhino, you know, the black rhino. There's the, the, uh, the, the what is it called about his lip? The hook lip rhino, the hook lip rhino, where his lip like comes out real weird. And then you have the round head or, or round uh, cheek, something like that, round face rhino, where he has his, his head like rounds real weird, like that. All those rhinos are the most common rhinos. We go to zoos a lot, all right? You want a rhino. I used to like like read and memorize the stuff at the zoo. We used to all, I love rhinos too, by the way. So, <clears throat> but here's the thing: when you when you look up rhinos. When they're classified, if you ever do go to the zoo and you read those little plaques or you talk to the curator, that's the person that shows you the exhibit, they, they will oftentimes not refer to them as rhinoceroses. You know, they'll refer to them as by their Latin name. Because most animals are actually classified when they're studied 
by their Latin name. Now, you know what all those rhinos that I just referred to as a moment ago are, are, are actually called, you know, the ones that possess two horns. Does anyone know what they're called? You know, uh, you know it starts with a, you know, with a B. I'll give you a hint. Bicornis, exactly. Bicornis, just like, you know, bi meaning two, like a bicycle because it has two wheels and sickles like cycle, right? So, you know, bicornis, it means two, and cornus, you know, comes from the word horn, saying that it has two horns. Now, the animals that have one horn, the rhinoceros, is all the species of animals, the most common being the, the uh, Asian rhino, I believe it is, and the Indian, I know for a fact, only has one. But I believe the Asian and the Indian both only have one horn. Do you know what they're referred to as in their Latin name? Unicornis. That's what they're called. They're called the unicornis. If you go and you look at the, uh, if you go and you look and I've seen this, this is where I, this is actually what first sent me on this. I, I grew up in the Cincinnati area. We used to go to Cincinnati Zoo all the time. And I have been, you know, I have dedicated my life to the Lord. And, and when I was around 21, I got saved when I was like 12. I started serving God. About two years after, I was really into studying my Bible. We were at the zoo one day. And I was just constantly thinking, what is a unicorn? You know, I was reading my Bible and I saw it popping up all the time. What is a unicorn? You know, and one day I was at the zoo, and I don't know if my wife remembers this or not, but I, like I said, I read the blacks and everything. And then I noticed one of the animals, one of the, one of the rhinos was actually referred to as something by cornice. And I was like, what in the world? And I thought about that, I was like, of course that's Latin. You know, and I was like, why? Because there's two. And I was like, and it popped in my mind, do you know what one would be? Unicornis. And I pulled out my phone and started doing some research, and then I looked it up more. And there's a lot more information about this. So, notice a moment ago I read the definition from a modern Webster's Dictionary of what, it, what people say that a unicorn is today. What was it? A mythical force-like creature with a, you know, a horn projecting out of its forehead, right? But if you go to an 1828 dictionary, remember your King James Bible was translated in 1611. So if you go to a dictionary, the Webster's Dictionary, the same company that printed the dictionary that we just got that definition from a moment ago, that was printed in 1828. This is the only the, the only definition pertaining to this animal. There's another, another one about a sea unicorn. But listen to what unicorn meant in 1828. An animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. So if you look up the definition of a unicorn in an 1828 dictionary, of what it actually meant right after the King James Bible was translated. Someone sat down to read their Bible and they read the word unicorn. Do you know what if they opened up, hey, let's look at a dictionary. Do you know what the dictionary would tell you that it was? A rhinoceros. Now, even maybe even more interesting than that, if you look up in that same dictionary, just look up the word rhinoceros, it says this, a genus of quadrupeds of two species, one of which... The unicorn as a, as a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. The animal when full grown is said to be 12 feet in length. There is another species with two horns, the bicornis. They are natives of Asia and Africa. So notice, you look up unicorns and it's like it's a rhino. You look up rhino or rhinoceros, what does it tell you it is? It's a unicorn. Notice that in the 1828 dictionary. So you know what has happened? From 1828 to 2018, the definition has been corrupt. It's been changed. Further proof of that, and this is actually what I was referring to a minute ago. This is extremely interesting. This is, this is extremely interesting. So, if anyone familiar with the Latin Vulgate, that is the Catholic Bible, right? The Latin Vulgate is the Catholic Bible. So, if you look, the, <coughs> if you look up the verses in the Latin Vulgate, which is where that name comes from. Where our word today, unicorn and bi, you know, a unicorn comes from, it's unicornis. That's a Latin word. So if you look it up in the Latin Bible, all of those verses where a unicorn shows up, you know what it says? All these different things. When these guys are a bunch of idiots when it comes to the Bible, is what the facts are. They don't even, why don't you, if you want to mock the Bible, don't try to pretend and act like you've done your due diligence when it comes to, hey, I looked at the Bible and the word unicorn is mentioned. Therefore, I reject the Bible. Well, what, is the, what does the word unicorn actually mean? Maybe, why don't we look it up? You know what? You know what happens every time when you really study out the words of the Bible? And when you really do your due diligence? 
The Bible comes out on top every single time. It makes perfect sense. It lines up. So do you know when we're reading through Job chapter number 39, and we see all these animals being mentioned, they're all what? They're all factual animals that we can all look around and see today. And do you know what Job 39 verse 9 and 10, when God's speaking to Job? Now think about a, now think about a rhino when you see a unicorn. What he says, with the, with the rhino, let's say that, would the rhino be willing to serve thee? Are you going to bind him and put him in your crib? Are you, no, he says, he says are, are you gonna, is he going to abide by thy crib? And then he tells him, you know, in, uh, in verse number 10, he tells him, you know, are you going to put a band on him and get him to furrow? And, you know, and get him to harrow the ground? Is that possible? No. So that, what, you know how, how much sense it makes when you look at it as a rhino? Now, here's the only objection. And I believe this for a little while, and probably a lot of people here probably have heard a lot of that information, maybe not all of it. But I brought it up. <coughs> I brought it up to a lot of people and persuaded a lot of people to my view on this. And there was one person that gave me uh, some pushback on it. And he was really stuck on this being like a horse-like animal. And I was like, well, what's your proof of that? You know, from the Bible. And he didn't have anything besides this. In Psalm chapter number 29, verse number 6. Let's go to Psalm chapter 29, verse number 6. It's, it's just one book forward. Psalm chapter number 29, verse number 6. He looked up all the verses and he came back to me. He already, <laughs> he already wanted it to be a horse-like creature because he didn't have this verse when he was, when he was kind of giving me pushback. Then he went home and he looked up all these verses. And this, and this guy ended up being a missionary and went over to Africa. I mean, that actually ties him with, into the story here in just a moment. But look at Psalm chapter 29, verse number 6. Notice what it says here. He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn. So he said to me, like, notice how it's referred to, and he says, like a calf. And I was like, yeah, but here's the thing, buddy. A calf is just a young animal. Do you know what rhinos are called, too, when they're born? Calves. And you know what that rhino is also referred to elsewhere? It calls them a bullock. If you, I think I read that verse, actually. You know what a grown male rhino is called? A bull. That's what a grown male rhino is called. So all of those actually apply just as well for my theory, right? And he's like, but also look at that. It says it skips. It skips like a unicorn. He's like, unicorns don't skip. You ever looked up videos about unicorns? So I looked up videos about unicorns. And I was like, oh, I don't know. That same guy went to Africa. You know what's in Africa? <laughs> Rhinos. <laughs> he calls me up one day over WhatsApp, and he's like, dude, I had to call you. He's like, I just saw a baby rhino run by me, and he said it was the perfect definition of skipping. <laughs> he, said, he said, I am 100% sold that a rhino, that a unicorn rhino is a rhino. I am 100% sold. And I actually, he actually got that argument from someone else, is where he got that argument. But here's the thing. When you look at it being a horse-like creature, you can debunk that from that angle, number one. You can see that the horse is mentioned in the context. Then you can see that the horse is actually being domesticated in the context, and this animal is not. And repeatedly, the great strength is mentioned about this animal, saying he's got greater strength than all these other animals, greater strength than the horse, and he cannot be domesticated. We look around at the world, a rhino is the only animal that meets that, that qualification. Then we look up, actually, when the King James Bible was translated, 200 years after even, and the definition is still rhino. You look up rhino, and, right, and I don't know if you thought about this, but actually when it says rhinoceros in 1828 dictionary, in that context, it just refers to the rhino casually as a unicorn, also known as a unicorn, saying that that's what it's still being called today. Then... You look up the Latin Vulgate, and all the times almost, not every time, uh, it, <coughs> it's translated as unicornis or unicornium. That's plural in, in Latin when it's not I-U-M or something like that. But then it's translated as, sometimes as this, rhinoceros or rhinocerium in their Bible, which I believe the King James Bible is perfect. Amen. You, rhino and unicorn mean the same thing, just like they meant the same thing in 1828. So I don't need that to be, you know, that's not a proof to me from the English text. But what I can do is look at the language in which that word came from, and we can see what that word means in its original language. And, and in a Bible, 
that's translated into Latin where the word unicorn came from. So that word derives from Latin. Where it came from Latin, if you look up that word in the Latin Bible, they'll translate that same word in their language as unicorn and rhino, both, in the Latin Vulgate. Look it up if you don't believe me. Go on Bible Gateway, type in all, type in unicorn, and then pull up the Latin Vulgate in the language of Latin, and you'll see it plain and simple, unicornis, unicornium, rhinoceros, rhinocerium. Over and over and over again. So as I said... The King James Bible every time comes out correct. So this is this is a, I mean, something to learn about this. When you read the Bible and something like is daunting to you, it can bother you, and you're like, what in the world? Why are the unicorns being mentioned in the Bible? Do your due diligence. Study out the Bible. Right. You know, look up every time that word is mentioned and see, is this telling me that this is a horse? I didn't even need to do all that other, all those other things. I could have went to Job 39. I can see in the context it's not a horse. We could use the Bible as our definition. Look around the world today. There's only one animal. Only one that fits the, the uh, description that's given of the unicorn. And it's clearly, and without a shadow of a doubt, a rhinoceros. So let's move on. Let's go to another uh, uh, you know, mocking point that the atheist will look at. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter number 11. And I also want you to go to Colossians chapter number 2. So if in your left hand... Third book in the Bible, Leviticus chapter number 11. If you have your bulletin still, you can slide that in there. Leviticus chapter number 11. <coughs> then I want you to go to Colossians chapter number 2. That's in the New Testament, one of Paul's, Paul's epistles. Colossians chapter number 2. Now, this is another point that, that uh, as I said, the atheists will bring up and they'll try to mock the Bible, right? Normally, this is brought up if anything about homosexuality is mentioned. The Bible very plainly and clearly declares homosexuality to be an abomination. So if you mention that to an atheist, you say, you know, the Bible says, or, you know, homosexuality is an abomination. Almost all of them. It's like they have a forum that they all go to, or they have some meeting and they all repeat the same thing. They'll all say the same thing almost all the time. What did you have? Shellfish recently? Did you eat bacon this morning? Well, the Bible says you're an abomination too. Has anyone heard that before? Yeah. Numerous times. Well, then you're just as much an abomination as a homosexual is. But I'm going to show you and explain to you the foolishness of that. I'm going to explain to you, you know, uh, from the Bible, the clear explanation of the, there's a major difference between the two. Now, the first thing is to understand this. In the Old Testament law, the law is broken into two components or into two parts. It's broken into the moral law and it's broken into the ceremonial law. Now the moral law is just like we said that that's morally wrong. It's things that are just inherently wrong or intrinsically wrong. It is wrong, just wrong to lie, isn't it? It's just wrong to steal. It's just wrong to kill someone, right? And these things have been wrong from the beginning of time, right? We can see God, you know, disciplining or punishing people for murdering all the way up until Cain and Abel. Cain. So it was wrong from the beginning of time to kill someone. It's always been wrong to do all of it. That is the moral law. It's just, it's always has been and always will be wrong to, you know, you know, kill someone just like that. The moral law, right? Well, when God gave the law or the commandments to the nation of Israel, part of it was the moral law, but then he instituted a lot of new things. That is the ceremonial law. Or the, these are rituals, right? These would be things that would be like rituals or ordinances. We, another thing we could refer to these as. Now, the ceremonial law or the ordinances... These are things that God tells them kind of like, you know, how he wants to separate them from, the nation of Israel, separate them from all the world. These are things that are used in that sense. Most of these are used to separate them from all the world. But they are meant to be pictures or shadows of things to come, of Jesus Christ. They shadow and they picture Jesus Christ or things to come about Jesus, things that he will do, different aspects of Jesus. And these are not morally wrong to do throughout history. But think about, but this I do want you to understand. 
when God instituted these as laws or commandments, if you would have broken these commandments or laws, it would have been a sin to do so. When God says don't do something, no matter what it is, it's a sin to break it, isn't it? Right. So throughout the Old Covenant, if you would have, and we're going to get to this, eaten shrimp, it was a sin to do so. Right? right? But the Old Covenant came to an end at one point, didn't it? And then the New Testament came in. Here's the thing. The moral law still stands. Right? It's still wrong to kill somebody. It's still wrong to lie. It's still wrong to steal. All of these things were wrong before God gave the law as well. God punished people for murdering. Right? And here's a key thing because this is what the people want to argue about all the time when you bring it up to atheists. You say homosexuality is an abomination. They'll say to you, well, it's an abomination to eat bacon too. Well, here's the thing. I want you to think about this. When Noah got off the ark, he was given the privilege or the authorization to eat everything. He said, eat whatever you want, right? He can eat anything that he wanted. Before God gave the law about those about the dietary restrictions, they could eat anything that they wanted, right? But do you know what happened before the law was given? The most famous story about homosexuals? Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And you know what God did long before the law was given, proving that it is a part of the, of the moral law? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said that they were sinners and wicked before the Lord exceedingly. So you know what that tells you? That homosexuality is clearly a part of the moral law. It has always been wrong and will always be wrong to be a homosexual. Man. But Noah was given the privilege when he got off the ark, eat anything he want. So notice we can prove that the dietary restrictions were temporary for that specific time. Now, I want you to look at Colossians 2. I want to start off showing you that the Bible is abundantly clear that you can eat anything that you want today. Look at Colossians 2. So if you bring this up to an atheist and an atheist tries to say, well, you shouldn't be eating pork or you shouldn't be eating shrimp, explain to him that that law was done away when Christ died on the cross. When the new covenant was instituted, his blood was you know, put on the altar in heaven to be specific. The new covenant was established and the ceremonial laws were done away with. I want you to look at Colossians chapter number 2. <coughs> I want you to look at verse number 14. It says this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What does it mean to blot something out? It means to do away with it, doesn't it? It's gone. You're blotting it out. You're putting a lot of ink over top of something. You're blotting it out. Notice what's being blotted out, too. The ordinances. Those are small laws. That's referring to the ceremonial law. And he defines for you what he's talking about in just a moment. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and has spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumph, triumphing over them in it. And then he says this in verse 16. Pay attention. These are the ordinances. Let no man therefore, so because the ordinances have been blotted out, let no man therefore judge you in meat, that's foods. Meat in the Bible just means food, any food. In meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. So notice all the days that they, that they practiced, that they followed, the feast, the new moon, the Passover, if you will, all of those. The day of Pentecost, all of those things, right? These practices we do not have to follow anymore in the New Testament. What else do we not have to follow? The meats and the drinks. All the specific things about even the sacrifices and the dietary restrictions. We don't need to follow those things today. He says, let no man therefore judge you in meats or in drinks, right? Saying that they were blotted out. The, uh, the ordinances were blotted out. Look at verse 17. It actually tells you what they represented. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So notice those ordinances were only instituted because they pictured things to come. But once, once they pictured Christ, and once Christ actually came, there was no need for them anymore. I'll give you a perfect example of the sacrifice in the Old Testament. The Lamb. Right? What did it picture? Jesus. The Lamb of God. You know what stopped at that time? No more sacrifices. Because the real sacrifice had came. Amen. It only pictured the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the, the, the true sacrifice coming and once he came, there was no need for the shadow anymore. There was no need for the figure, the type. Right. Now we have the real sacrifice. Amen. Right? All of the ceremonial...
ceremonial law was done away with because the only purpose of it was just to picture things to come. Different things that would happen or occur when Christ came, or as an effect of Christ coming. As a result, I'm sorry. Look over at Hebrews chapter number uh, 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I believe it's 9. Yes, Hebrews chapter number 9. Look at verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present. Notice the word figure. Just like we said it was a shadow, right? Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So he talked about the different things that they would do at the, at the tabernacle, right, and later on to be the temple, all of these things that were instituted. Now look at verse 10 again. Which stood only in meats and drinks. Remember that mentioned a moment ago. And divers washings and carnal ordinances. Notice that. Carnal ordinances. So all the ceremonial law, the ordinances, all of these things... You know, these were only for a time present. Look at what it says right after that. It tells you that. For a temporary time. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. So they were imposed on them until the time of the reforming or the reformation. You know, it's not the Protestant reformation. The reformation referring specifically to when Christ came and he reformed the covenant. He established the new covenant. That's what the book of Hebrews here and specifically chapter 9 is talking about. All the changes that took place when Christ came and died. The ceremonial law at that time was done with. So here in the New Testament, can you eat shrimp if you want to? Yeah. Can. can you eat pork or anything? Amen. You can eat whatever you want, right? Why? Because those were carnal ordinances and they're done away with. Because they were just a picture of things to come. Now I want you to turn back over to Leviticus chapter number 11. I'm going to read to you. Go to Leviticus chapter number 11. And uh, actually, sorry to do this to you. Look at Acts. Let's go to Acts. I want you to go to Acts. I didn't have this plan, but I want to show you, because it actually defines for you what it pictured. The unclean and the clean beast. So you're in Acts 10. Keep your hand there. Now look at Leviticus. I want to compare these two, one right after the other. That's why I wanted your hand there. So if you look in, once you get your hand in Acts chapter number 10, Yes, it is chapter 10. I want to verify that. Go back to Leviticus chapter number 11. Now, here's the, the, the notorious chapter where all the clean beasts are laid out and then all the unclean beasts are laid out. When you read through here, chapter number 11, verse 20, tells them, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. <laughs> and he goes through and he starts giving specifications on what qualifies to be eaten as a clean beast and what does not. Verse 3, Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So he gives them a couple of qualifications there, and then he goes through and explains things, if they don't do this, if they do do that, and he has other qualifications as well for other types of animals. So there are some animals that end up being referred to as unclean, and some animals that end up being referred to as clean. If you look at the end of the chapter, in uh, Leviticus chapter number 11, look at that quickly. It tells them at the very end, notice the purpose of this law, verse 44. For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourself. Now the word sanctify means to set apart, to be different. So, I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and, and ye shall be holy, set apart. For I am holy, neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So notice the purpose of this is to sanctify them or to set them apart. Referring to the other nations of the world. So there's a big difference between the, the nation of Israel, the way that they act, the way that they eat, and then all of the other nations of the world. If you look at the very last verse there, notice what it says in verse number 47. To make a difference between the unclean and the clean. Now, think about the nation of Israel. What were they supposed to be? They were supposed to be the clean, representing all the Gentiles, all the, 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 the nations of the world, those that were not you know, saved, those that were not a part of the nation of God. They were unclean, right? But then you have them saying right after that, in between the beasts that, that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. So in the same breath, it says between the clean and the unclean, the beasts that should be eaten and the beasts that should not be eaten, 
Right before that, he said, I want to sanctify, the reason why I want to do this is I want to sanctify you. Now look at Acts chapter number 10, and here we have where the very first time the nation of Israel or uh, you know, those that, that follow the old covenant, they're actually told, you, don't, you can eat whatever you want now. Look at Acts chapter number 10. This is the story of Peter when really one of the first open Gentiles comes to those that are Jews. There are other Gentiles that were saved, but this is the first time where it was in clarity. Like this guy is obviously a Gentile. He's not of the nation of Israel. So look at verse 9. On the morrow as they went on their journey, so they're, they're going to meet Peter. These are Gentiles. They're not of the nation of Israel. His name is Cornelius. So just give you the context. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him. As it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So all manner, all types of animals, right? Creeping things, he's saying everything. And if we would have read in Leviticus 11, creeping things are unclean. So you're not allowed to eat that. Verse 13, he says this, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. So this is God speaking to Peter. And what is God telling Peter? I want you to eat. It's a vision. He shows him all of the animals of the earth, all of them, animals that are clean and unclean. And he says, I want you to eat this. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Look at verse 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again, the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So saying, God's saying that he's cleansed that now. You can eat that now, right? And then verse, verse 16, This was done thrice. So he said it again a couple more times. Like, I'm not so, Lord. You know, and then, so it happened three times. This was done thrice, and it says, And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Look at verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. So at this time he's like, what does this mean? You know, what is God trying to tell me? Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius, Peter didn't know they were coming, had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing. So he's telling them, you need to go with these people. Don't doubt anything. Don't question it. Just go with them. Now I want you to skip down to um, verse 23. <clears throat> then called he them in and lodged, and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now verse 24, watch this. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Verse 27. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. Now verse 28, watch this closely. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But watch this. But God hath showed me, talking about the people, that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now what, what happened in the vision? What did he see? He saw the animals, didn't he? But what did those animals actually represent? The peoples, the nations, the tongues, right? The nations of the world. And then the clean animals would have represented Israel, while all the other animals represented the nations of the world. And then God showed him afterwards, after he saw that vision, that those animals representing the Gentiles, those animals can now be clean, right? Those animals can now be, you know, if you will, a part of Israel. Because what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross? The Bible tells you in Ephesians chapter number 2 that he broke down that wall of partition between the Gentile and between the nation of Israel. Jesus said because the nation of Israel had rejected him, he said that the kingdom was taken from them and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And what is that nation? Is it a specific nation geographically located? No. The Bible says that it's a nation made up of all kindreds and tongues and people. 
In the Old Testament, God dealt with a specific nation and a kingdom, right? Well, in the New Testament, once they rejected God in the flesh, God did away with that. And then he offers that unto everyone, unto all the world, right? And you can all immediately be a part of that nation as soon as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You become a child of God, a son of God, and you are of the nation of Israel. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. And then it, it tells you that the circumcision, that's, which is outward in the flesh, that he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. So that is what makes you a part of the nation of Israel, is inwardly whether you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And do you know what those, that ceremonial law in the Old Testament actually represented? It represented that period of time while God was dealing with the nation of Israel only. They were the clean, and then the Gentiles were unclean. Now, those, those people could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, but at that moment specifically, they didn't just become a part of the nation of, of, of God physically, did they? Well, that physical nation is just done away with now. Totally. There is no physical nation dwelling on the earth. They became a Jew spiritually, if you will, but there was still a physical nation on the planet at that time that God was dealing with. And in order to be a part of that nation, they would have had to forsake all that they had, just like uh, you know, uh, we have Ruth doing, right? She leaves being a Moabite, and then she goes to the nation of Israel, and she converts and becomes a Jew, if you will, right? Becomes a Jew, and then she is then at that time a part of the physical nation of God. But notice, when Jesus died on the cross, what did he do? He blotted out all the ordinances against us. What's one of the ordinances? The meats and drinks. The unclean and clean. Because why? It was a shadow of things to come. And what happened when he died? <coughs> broke down that wall of partition. It was shadowing that they, there, there's clean and unclean. And then once that's done away with, Christ comes. And it's all they're all animals are the same. He says, what God has cleansed, call not about common or unclean. Now, I do want to say something about Leviticus 11 real quick. Now, I've heard different people's opinions about Leviticus 11. But here's the thing. When you look at Leviticus 11... There is no way that you can deny the pattern of the types of animals that are chosen here. I've heard people say all different types of things about, you know, the, the particular animals that are chosen and what they represent and what they are and why God chose these specific animals. And here's, here's the fact. All of God's laws are practical, aren't they? God didn't just randomly pick animals, right? Now, in the New Testament, it is not a sin to eat any sort of animal. You can eat anything you want. You have the right to eat anything you want. You're not sinning. But if you look at the animals in Leviticus 11, you know what types of animals all of them are? And it's ignorant to just ignore this. They're dirty and they're scavengers. They're vultures. They're ravens, aren't they? They're creeping things. So, they're, you know, the pig, which is literally one of the dirtiest animals in the earth. I eat bacon all the time. Amen. But I'm just saying, let's not ignore the practical aspect of Leviticus chapter number 11. You know, uh, chewing the cud. Do you know what's the significance of chewing the cud? Do you know what that means? The cud is a specific reference to food that has been, and hopefully this doesn't gross you out too much, belched back up and then chew, it's being chewed again. Have you ever seen a cow? What are they always doing? Just constantly, aren't they? That food was previously in their stomach already. In one of their stomachs. Well, in one of the chambers within their stomach. Cows have four stomachs. Four chambers within their stomach. Let me reword that again. Cows have four chambers within their stomach. Is everybody, was everybody aware of this? They have four chambers within their stomach. And it processes or digests their food four times. So how... So, how much cleaner is it? What, what, it's, it's basically, let's just say this. Because I was going to explain how much cleaner is the flesh going to be after all of that you know, cleanses through and then actually what's added unto the body, right? So what's happening is, is that it's, it's purging every nutrient that it can and then it's going into the flesh of that animal. So the, 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 the cleanliness of the meat of that animal is far cleaner than an animal that just has one chamber in their stomach. There's significance to why he says, hey, I want you eating animals that you eat. There's significance to why he's saying, hey, don't eat shrimp. I don't know if you know, you know that I'm allergic to shrimp, so it's not going to bother me at all. But the shrimp is, is literally known as the cockroach of the sea. It's the cockroach of the sea. Do you know where it lives? It's a bottom dweller. And if you look up the foods and the things that it eats and stuff, it's like feces and stuff like that, literally. 
It's just dwelling on it's eating you know, poop is what it's eating. And it's eating scum and dirt and things like that its whole life. It's like taking cockroach out of the... And you may not think of it like this and eating it. That's how dirty shrimp is. The animals that he mentions, they have to have scales. They have to have fins. You know why? They're swimming around. They're moving. Their body is more in fit. It's more muscular. Right? What happens to animals when they sit around? It's bad meat. Why are chickens bad when they're... Why do we want free-range chicken? chickens? Rickets. Chickens. Because they're moving around. Right? They have good meat. It's not good when an animal's just stagnant. So God says, hey, the animals in the ocean, eat the ones that have, scale, that have scales, that have fins. He's saying the ones that swim around at the point. They're moving. They have good meat on their body. The ones that chew the cud, it's good for them. So to just try to come up with some other excuse, people do this all the time for why these, it's silliness. There's a practical reason why these animals are chosen. You know the other type of animal? Don't eat creeping things. You know why? Where, where did the shrimp dwell? Bottom of the ocean, what's on the floor? Floors are dirty, right? Creepy things are things that drag their stomach when they go. They're on the ground. They're living in crevices and rocks. Is that, is that a clean environment? No. So why did God say, hey, don't eat these things? What was the reason? The dirty animals. So we need to just admit that. So don't, you know, don't try to act like when you're eating your, your pork. And I'm going to eat pork too. I'm not, stop, yeah, I'm not saying anything about it. But be, but be honest, you understand? And don't say, oh, you know, Leviticus 11, you know, God just uh, had nothing to do with the lifestyle of the pig. That's stupid. It really is. We have to just look at, in God's practice, you know what it does is this. This is why it's important as well. And we're going to look at like three verses just real quick. We're going to look at these and we're going to be done. This is why it matters. Because it shows the intelligence of the mind of the person that wrote the Bible. This type of diet and understanding, eat this type of animal, not this type of animal, we may take these things for granted today, but it is far, far superior to the, a lot, the intelligence of a lot of the civilizations and the men that lived upon the earth at the time the Bible was written. You may look around and say, well, this is just common sense. No, it's, it's common sense because of the culture you live in, the things that you've been taught. Go to some barbaric country today and see the types of foods and the understanding that they have between clean and unclean and things to eat and things not to eat. They don't know these things, and you just take, you're just you taking it for granted. You know why? Atheists want to mock the Bible, and they want to bring up all the unclean and clean foods, but it actually is an attestation to the wisdom of the mind that wrote the Bible. The Bible was far ahead far ahead of its time. And that's why real quick we're going to look at verses real fast. While we're in Leviticus and things like that, we're going to go through these. We'll be done in five minutes. Look at Leviticus 17, 11. Leviticus chapter number 17, verse number 11. Leviticus chapter number 17, look at verse number 11. The Bible says this. <coughs> For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar. It goes on and on. But notice that first statement. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Now what's going to happen if you read this verse and you understand that the life is in the blood, what's going to happen to your thought about blood and keeping it in your body, right? You're going to understand you don't want to lose too much blood or you're going to lose your what? Life. life. You know that there was a practice in the 17 and early 1800s in our nation and other Western civilizations, Europe, called bloodletting. You know what they did? This is just 200 years ago, folks. They thought that you had blood, bad blood. So you know what they did? They cut you, and they let, let means like hinder, things like that, or, or it means to let it out. They would, they would, they, what's letting the blood is, is you know, the, the skin. So they cut the, the skin, and they would let the blood out, and they would just let, you know, they think you got bad blood, so you just need to get your blood out of your body. Would you do that if you read Leviticus 1711? No. No, because you understand the life of the flesh is in the blood, right? I'm going to die if I let too much blood out. You know how George Washington died? He died by bloodletting. He died because somebody just let, they let too much blood out. You know what? He lost his blood, so he lost his what? Life. Life. So you know what you see here when we read the Bible? The wisdom of the Bible is written thousands of years ago. Go to Numbers chapter number 19. Numbers chapter number 19. Numbers chapter number 19. The cleanliness of the United States today and Europe and all of the Western societies comes from the culture of the Bible. The reason why we know all the things we know about science, about you know just just having about, about good health and things along sanitation, it's from the Bible actually. Amen. The same lifestyle that we're living today is the same lifestyle that the Israelites were living. I don't know if you've ever compared and looked at it. You know the women are supposed to every time once they once they're done cooking and making preparing meat, you know what they have to do in the Bible? Wash, Wash their hands. Wash their hands. 
Do you, do you know how long after it was, you know, that they uh, discovered, you know, the, the, the dirtiness that dead uh, of, a, of dead flesh that it contained? Look at Numbers chapter number 19, look at verse number 14. It says, this is the law when a man dieth in a tent. All that cometh into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. Why? No one knew about this. You take this for granted that no one knew that a dead body has potentially harmful microorganisms on it. Things that you cannot see. No one knew this cultures thousands of years ago. No one. But God said, hey, if a dead body dies in a room, somebody's in there, anybody who's in there, they're unclean for seven days. All that's in the tent, every person, they need to stay away from other people. They need to get away. They may have some disease or something on them. They need to stay alone in solitaire for seven days. Look at the next verse. This is even more amazing. Look at verse 15. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. Do you know what that means? That whoever authored this book understood that dead body dies there. It's not moving. But from, for, in some way, germs or something harmful from that body that I can't see can make it into this vessel all the way over here. Do you know what that is? Airborne germs. What else could you explain this to be? It's talking about sicknesses, harmful, potentially harmful microorganisms, you know, things along that line, but it's airborne germs from a dead body. That is amazing. Now, you, you, you may look, like I said, and think that you may take these things for granted, but if you want, if, if you know, the atheists, they're a mock and scoff at the Bible, the Bible science is why we have discovered a lot of the things that we know today. Right. You know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in, I thought it was Australia, but I'm, I can't remember exactly. The way that they actually discovered, <coughs> you know, uh, um, different types of just microorganisms, right? Organisms that, organisms that you can't see, things that are potentially harmful for you. The way in which what set them on the path of discovering this, go to Leviticus chapter 15, verse 14, was... <coughs> This is the last passage we're turning to. This is just 150 years ago we discovered this, folks. 150 years ago. was There was a hospital where they were birthing women. There was two floors of the hospital. They were birthing women. One floor, women were dying at a five times higher rate than the other floor. So this guy's like going back and forth and he's trying to figure out what's going on. He's testing this, he's testing that. He has no idea. He's eliminating this. Oh, it's still happening. So it wasn't that. Eliminating this, and he couldn't figure it out. And then some guy that was that was there actually ended up getting sick and dying from it. They called it like child fever or something like that. Because what was going on was a doctor would birth a baby, and then he would go and birth another baby, and <clears throat> whatever sickness that the first woman had, it was given it to the second woman. This is just 150 years ago. And they're like, we don't know what's going on. Well, this is what was going on. So, let's say this. Actually, I made a mistake there. A doctor would birth a baby, he, and then another man would go birth a baby, and somehow between the two people, that same sickness was being passed from that woman to this man to this man to that woman. You understand what I'm saying? So two different doctors. But well, now they were washing their hands. They had a community, a community basin. It's like a pot with water sitting in it. Right? And they even started putting chlorine in it, and that wasn't enough to fix it. Where they would all go and just dump their hands in it, clean their hands. So, you know what happened was the disease, the bloodborne disease, whatever it was that this woman had, this guy goes and washes his hands in there, oh, I'm done for the day, and leaves. You know what he leaves behind him? Whatever sickness or disease that that woman had is floating around in that water. So the other doctor, they have to wash their hands before and after, right? He goes and goes to wash his hands before the birth, you know what he just put on his hands? That bacteria. Walks in there, it's touching the woman, you know, touching her all different types of areas that, that, that will give you a disease, open area, right? And then guess what happens? He transfers that disease to this woman. And then they realize, look at Leviticus 15, what Leviticus 15, 14, already they already would have known. Leviticus 15, 14. Let me turn to myself. That would have been dramatic and then I ruined it. Look at Leviticus 15, 14. It says, And on the eighth day, he shall take... Am I in the right place? Oh, shoot. 
Long verse. Somebody look up for me real quick, and I'll entertain the audience for uh, running water. Type in running water. Verse 13. Is it verse 13? Perfect. Thank you, brother. You saved me. Look at verse 13. And when he that hath an issue, what's an issue? It's a sickness, right? It's like some, it's, it's normally referring to something that's bloodborne a lot. It's like something that's oozing out, but it's a sickness, right? When he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes. Notice, the things that he was wearing, he was transferring his disease to that. But look at this specifically. And bathe his flesh in running water and shall be clean. Do you know how they fixed the problem when they were birthing the women? They did away with just standing water, and they had a fountain or what have you that was running water. So they washed the water off and went down into some sort of drainage pipe into a drainage system and it got rid of the bacteria. You know, all throughout the Bible, you look up the phrase running water throughout the Old Testament, multiple times. Anytime God commands them to use water to cleanse, you know what type of water he tells them to use? Running water. Why? Bunch of ignorant sheep herders. Bunch of ignorant goat herders. The, sci the science of the Bible is the reason why we've discovered the things that we've discovered today. All these atheists, they need to go back and they need to look and see actually the major discoveries during the industrial revolution of our country. You know, all the people that discovered, you know, how to, how to harness energy like electricity, all of the different, you know, mechanical devices that allow us to do the things that we do today. Look and see what those types of people, their philosophies were. You know what they were? They were Christians. They were deists in some sort. They believed in God. They you know why? Because when you look around at the world, in order to make sense of the world, you have to believe in God. You have to. Because why? You can't even you can't learn anything from observations if you think that everything's random. You have, in order to be able to test something repeatedly, you have to be able to predict the pattern of the source. So you have to know well, that's going to do that again, so I'm going to try this this time. If everything's random, then it makes no sense. Atheism is foolishness. Amen. The Bible is amazing, and you know, it just shows. All these atheists, just like the Bible says, they'll come in the last days, scoffers. What are they doing? Walking after their own lusts. Do they come to you and they try to reason with you? Or, hey, if you can show me, I believe. No. They mock the Bible. They're not interested in the Bible. They make fun of the Bible. Yeah, the Bible mentions unicorns. Did you really look into that, buddy? You're right, it does mention unicorns. And every description lines up with a rhinoceros. You go back to the language that it came from, you know what it is? The rhinoceros. You look at the, the, they don't understand the difference between the ceremonial law and then the moral law. And when we look into the ceremonial law, we look at the dietary restrictions, the, 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 the eating habits that God prescribes are thousands of years ahead of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a strong civilization's eating habits. Think about that. They were eating, their dietary restrictions that what they were eating, the types of foods they were eating, the way in which they were eating, the way in which they were living their lives, no one lived like that for another thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years. If that's not fascinating, I don't know what is. You know the only explanation? The God that made this world, he knows how it works. So he, he tells you, do you know what types of foods would be best for your diet? These. Do you know what you should do You know, after you touch those foods? Hey, that, that dead body, that animal, might be carrying this, that. You need to make sure you cleanse yourself. You know, when you walk, but when you cleanse yourself, you know what you need to do? Don't just use the same standing water. Use running water. Why? If we just think like, oh, just no. There's a reason why. The Bible's amazing. Amen. It really is. You know why? Because it's written by the Creator of this world. Right. The one that knows best how all things operate. So when an atheist tries to mock these things, use these verses. I hope you remember these verses. Pay attention to it. You can also look it up on YouTube if you want. But use this type of information and just show this and bring this to their mind. Hey, it may be one that's not too far gone. It's not just rejected God just to like, you know, maybe, maybe they've just been pulled into this mockery of God by a friend or something. And you can kind of convince them, hey, the Bible's actually extremely scientific. Let me show you a couple things that the Bible predicted thousands of years before mankind science, you know, actually found it. That's far as I have a word for it. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, the Bible. It's such an amazing book. Help us to cherish what we have. Help us not to take it for granted, dear Lord. Help us to love people. Help us 
uh, to uh, try to persuade people to learn things that may uh, be able to convince others uh, to uh, put their faith in your word and in the gospel specifically. We thank you above all things that you died for us and you gave us salvation for free. Please be with us and bless us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. So <laughs> why you turn in your hymnal to song number 30, Nothing But the Blood. <laughs> 